So right off the bat, just a little bit of information about myself. My name is Brian Weinfeld. Two days ago, I graduated with my master's in data science from City University of New York. Oh, the, yeah. No need for, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my background is in computer science with a statistics minor from Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. You may have deduced I am from the United States. Uh, I make mention of this fact because this presentation makes copious use of the letter Z, and I will endeavor not to mess it up. Apologies in advance if I happen to. Uh, even more exciting, though, than graduating, um, the Canadian government has bestowed upon me a work permit, so I'm also officially looking for work. So I would love to hear about any opportunities that you may have. My contact information is all up and down here, email address, LinkedIn, GitHub, and so on. Uh, my portfolio website is also on there, BrianDoesDataScience.com. Uh, you will also find many more adorable pictures of Java up there, uh, named after the programming language, yes. Uh, so come for the dog pictures, stay for the resume. Um, all right, enough about me. Let's jump in and let's talk about CareerCon 2019, Help Navigate Robots. So back in April, Kaggle put on a virtual job convention live streamed on YouTube, specifically aimed at people looking to transition into data science sometime over this calendar year. They held panels on all sorts of really helpful topics, how to write a resume, how to whiteboard, how to network, uh, and they did portfolio reviews live. Some of the hardest stuff I've ever watched, and it wasn't even my portfolio, but really helpful overall. So if you're looking to start a data science career, I highly recommend that you check out their videos. They're slowly putting them up on YouTube as we speak. Uh, in order to help bring awareness to this convention, they also sponsored a Kaggle competition called Help Navigate Robots. Uh, unlike the traditional Kaggle competition, which is a private company putting up their data and a cash prize, uh, Kaggle is sponsoring this competition. They collected the data, and they're offering the prize. Uh, the prize in this case is not cash. Instead, if you place in the top 100, they take a copy of your resume and pass it on to the partners at the career con. So I suppose, depending on your particular situation, maybe even more valuable than a one-time $50,000 grand prize. Uh, in addition, this competition is a little bit easier than the traditional Kaggle competition aimed at the junior data scientists that they were trying to bring into the convention uh, than the more traditional, harder challenges put forth on Kaggle. In this competition, we're using these robots right here. They're basically little remote-controlled Raspberry Pis on wheels. Uh, but the important part is that they have this thing called an IMU, or inertial measurement unit, inside of them. An IMU will collect data about the forces acting on the robot as it's being driven around. These things are super popular in high school physics classes. The kids get to drive them around, you upload the data, and then you use the numbers to derive those famous physics formulas that we all learned at some point in time in our lives. Uh, we're not doing physics tonight. Instead, we're doing a classification problem. We're going to classify which surface the robot was driving on based on the data from the IMU. Carpet, concrete, wood, tile, PVC, and the like. Nine different surfaces that we need to discover. We have 3,800 samples to work with, and the robot's IMU collects 10 different pieces of information. Those are going to be our features. Most interestingly, though, it's done in time series steps. So what I mean by that is the robot collects 10 pieces of information. It moves forward a set period of time and then collects the 10 values again. And then moves forward, collects, moves forward, and collects. 128 of them make up one sample. So we have 1,280 pieces of data to make our prediction, uh, but most interestingly, it's the same 10 values, and we can see how they change over time. Hello? Oh, great. Hi. Um, so in terms of the features, are they actually labeled with like what they actually are? Yes. So we're going to get into that in just a second. We'll get to see what they actually are and what they're measuring. OK, great. Once we've trained our model, we have another 3,800 predictions that we need to make. We'll make those predictions and upload them to Kaggle. So before the competition began, Kaggle has secretly selected half of these predictions to go to the public leaderboard and the other half to go to the private leaderboard. You upload your answers and the public leaderboard scores are shown to you immediately. The private leaderboard scores are held back until after the competition is over and those scores are revealed only at that time. It is only your score on the private leaderboard that matters. The public leaderboard is completely meaningless. Its only purpose is to, one, kind of give you an idea of how your model's performing on data it's never seen before, and to kind of let you jockey for position amongst the other competitors. But at the end of the day, private leaderboard is what matters. Our metric is super easy. It's accuracy. So 3,816 predictions, whoever gets the most right wins the day. 
Whenever I work on a project, I always like to end by reflecting on what it is that I took away from that project. Maybe it's something brand new that I learned, a misconception that I helped clarify, or just something interesting that I want to try in the future. So I'm hoping that I can impart three things on all of you tonight that you can take away and use as you go forward. Um, I heard the word data in a lot of job titles as we were going around the room, so we'll see how much of this is new to some of you. But at the very least, I hope to kind of give you an idea or a spark maybe for a future project. Uh, let's take a look at the data. So the 10 features can be broken down into three different categories, linear acceleration, angular velocity, and orientation. Uh, now, if you're anything like me and you haven't done physics since high school, the odds are you probably kind of sort of remember these words, but maybe not exactly so. I spent a ton of time just working through the data to understand what information I was collecting, and it turns out that what this data represents is immensely important to doing well in this competition. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes just kind of walking you through what the different pieces of information we're collecting are. This picture also ended up being incredibly helpful towards me, so I could reference what exactly it was that I was seeing in the data at any given moment in time. We can see from the image that forward and backwards is our x-axis, the left and right is our y-axis, and up and down is our z-axis. Uh, so with that being said, let's take a look at the data. Here's sample number zero in the first handful of time steps, right? There's 128, so we're just looking at the first handful. We have the linear acceleration and the angular velocity in the x, y, and z-axis for each one of these. Since this is time series data, uh, a really great and easy way is to simply visualize it by plotting it. So here is just an arbitrary soft tile floor that I've grabbed and plotted the linear acceleration for. So you can see the 128 time steps across the x-axis and then the corresponding values. Just to kind of interpret this a little bit, we see that the x is sitting around zero most of the time and we recognize that that's forward from the picture. Don't get confused like I did. This is not velocity, it's acceleration. Right? If your car is on the highway driving 100 kilometers an hour and you keep driving 100 kilometers an hour, your acceleration is zero. So when the acceleration is dipping below zero, the robot's slowing down. It's not going backwards. Even more of a conundrum, though, is that z-axis, which is hovering around negative 10, which is down, according to the picture. So apparently our robot is falling the entire time. That makes no sense. Um, in fact, when you look at all of the samples, uh, you see that every single sample has this attribute to it. So I did a huge deep dive, did all sorts of research, and I made an amazing discovery, uh, gravity. Uh, gravity is pulling all of us, everyone and everything, down towards the center of the planet at a nice stable 9.8 meters per second squared. So this is actually hovering around negative uh, 9.8. The deviations from negative 9.8 then are the uh, imperfections in the floor bumping the robot around. And it's those imperfections that are going to give away what surface the robot's driving on. I've arbitrarily picked one sample of each of the nine different surfaces so we can kind of get a sense as to the difference in the values that we can exploit. So for example, the concrete floor compared to the fine concrete floor. The regular concrete floor may be more bumpy, have holes in it that knock the robot around more so its z-axis is a bit more bumpy than the fine concrete. Really cool is a tile floor, the hard tile large space, and the hard tiles that have this nice wave-like pattern in the z-axis. I believe that that comes from the space in between the tiles. The robot hits the bump and falls a little bit, then catches the next tile and bumps up a little bit, and you get this nice little pattern going up and down across the values. Uh, question? Yes. Um, so when they're moving the robot around, is the robot just moving in one straight direction and then any imperfections in the surface are causing it to move left and right? Or is it wandering somewhat randomly? Because it looks like from here it's basically going straight. Sure, so that information wasn't given to us in the original competition, but we could pretty quickly deduce, just like you did, that the robots are more or less going in a straight line. Cool, thanks. Yep. Uh, my question is regarding concrete. So why is that uh, discrepancy for the concrete? Like if you see the beginning of the concrete plot, you see the acceleration has a huge jump and then it's kind of slows down. But for tile, for example, it wouldn't, because the grains for the concrete are not that big to create that kind of a bump. Sure, well we, don't, we can't see exactly what specific concrete floor this is, so we don't really know what we're dealing with, but I've seen a number of concrete floors where chips and pieces are missing, it's very bumpy, there's more imperfections than it just being newly installed. So we don't really know what type of quality surface this is. It could very well be the type of concrete out on the sidewalk that you're running over that's been there for 20 years and is in, is in disrepair. 
Uh, all right, so here is the same information again, angular velocity instead. Angular velocity measures whether the robot is being spun left and right, backwards and forwards, side to side. Uh, so maybe one wheel hits a divot in the floor and that pushes it to the left, and then maybe the other, wheel, the other wheel hits a divot and it pushes it in the other direction. That's more or less what the velocity is finding. Those are the first six features. Now let's take a look at the last four, which feature the orientation and another problem for all of us that aren't uh, physicists. Uh, orientation is now with X, Y, Z, and W, four dimensions for our orientation. This was another point of great confusion for me. Uh, all of us have dealt with orientation. We know the three dimensions. What's going on with W? Well, it turns out that the three dimensions that we're used to using in our daily lives are really bad for physics. Uh, the reason is so far outside the scope of what I'm talking about tonight. If you're super interested, you can Google the words gimbal lock. Uh, needless to say, it's not an issue for us. Uh, so even better than not having to worry about it, we're one quick Google search away from a nice little script that'll take these four dimensions and downsize them into the three dimensions that we're used to using. So that's what I've done here. Uh, these are referred to as our Euler angles, uh, but you might know them by their more traditional names, roll, pitch, and yaw. Uh, these are measured not by the forces acting on the robot, but measured in degrees. So we're talking about whether the robot is maybe facing north, south, east, or west. That's what yaw is measuring. Uh, so you can see from the image in the upper left-hand corner that this robot's orientation is remarkably consistent. In other words, if you were in the room while they were collecting data, to the naked eye, this robot's moving in a straight line. We know that it's not exactly a straight line, but more or less to the naked eye it would be. Zooming in on just the z-axis over here on the right, we can see those fine imperfections again that are moving the value a little bit. A really great way to interpret this right plot here is to imagine it as an overhead view. The robot is attempting to move from left to right in a horizontal line, but the imperfections in the floor are pushing it left and right as it moves, in this case, mostly to the right. Now, this is really great for us to use, but we can't just plop these values back into our model. And for a very good reason. Let's think about it for a moment. If I put the robot down on a surface that I want to measure and drive it across the room, and the robot just happens to be facing north, I then pick up the robot and make it face south and do the exact same ride. In order for our machine learning model to have any real attempt or ability to discern that they're the same surface, the values that it collects need to be very similar, at least more similar than the other surfaces. But there's a huge problem. The yaw is 180 off facing north one time and south the other time even though that really doesn't change anything about the other values we've collected. So we don't actually want to use the Euler angles in their original values. We just care about the differences or the changes in these values. So we can easily take care of that by simply differencing all the values. So now instead of using the uh, degrees, we're using the difference in degrees from time step to time step. How much is the robot getting pushed off of its straight line based on the imperfections in the floor? This is still in degrees. So again, the difference are incredibly small. Yes? How different is that from, um, what do you call it? I can't remember what the term you used for it was, but rotational acceleration, basically. Uh, angular velocity? And angu angular velocity, yes. That's a very good question, and it kind of gives away the game as to where we're going with this. So you can pat yourself on the back for kind of figuring out what's going on. Um, for everyone else who hasn't quite seen it just yet, I promise uh, we're going to do something really cool with this in a little bit. But good, good pickup. Uh, here is an example from each of the samples one more time for our orientation, again, to kind of give us an idea of the different values that we're going to be using to make our predictions. All right, here are our surfaces that we're going to be predicting. We have nine of them, and as you can see, the data is pretty heavily skewed. There's no single surface that makes up a majority of the predictions, but look at the difference between concrete and hard tiles. Hard tiles, in particular, has 22 samples in the training set. This ended up being a huge nightmare to address in our model. We'll take a, a deeper dive into that in just a second, because I know we're doing a lot on the data. One last slide. This actually ends up being incredibly important a bit later on. Here is the sample of the answers that were given to us for the training data. I recognize the series, and I recognize the corresponding answer, but there's this weird third column called session ID that we need to deal with. Uh, so if you notice, all the session ID 31s are concrete, all the session ID 20s are concrete, and all the session ID 25s are carpet. So what's going on? Uh, the session ID is a number that runs from 1 to 71, and it represents the 71 times they took the robot out of the office to go collect data. Go, take it out, collect data, bring it back, upload it, and they did that 71 times. That means that when they went out for a single session, they went on the exact same surface each time. Not the same type of surface, literally the exact same surface. 
So all session 31s are not just a concrete floor, but the same singular concrete floor. And all session ID 20s are a concrete floor, but a different one from session ID 31. This ends up being critical. Check this out. Everything that you're looking at right now is the angular, excuse me, the linear acceleration for concrete floors, all of them. You can see the session ID that shows that the top six are all from the same concrete floor, while the bottom three are from different concrete floors. If I strip the headers off of all of these, I think we'd all more or less be in agreement that the top six are more similar to each other than any of the bottom three. So when we're splitting the data for training and validation, we need to be careful to split on the session ID, not the surface, because we want to make sure that we get examples of every single surface in both the training and the validation. You can imagine how you might end up with a model that does unrealistically well or unrealistically poorly just based on how you happen to shuffle the data if you only split on the surface alone. All right, enough about the data. Let's go back to the hard tiles and talk about that class imbalance. Just a question on that last point. So if we're trying to predict the surface of a new surface that we've never been on before, then we want to know if the model is generalizing to new surfaces, right? Yes. Um, so maybe, so, so when you say we're splitting on the surface, are you saying we're going to put all, all session zeros in training? No, quite the opposite. If we split on surface, that might happen, and we might end up putting all of the session ID zeros into training, and that would be problematic, especially if we end up in a situation where all session ID fives go into validation. Now we're not training on any of that concrete surface, and we lose anything that we might gain from that, that concrete floor. So we're going to split on session ID instead to make sure we get an example of every single floor in our training data. I, I do see that perspective. There is a counter perspective of looking at your validation scores and being able to see if it's actually generalizing to a new surface that you've never seen before. And you, you might not, you, you might be overfitting to some of the, like, the specific parameter or the specific types of surfaces, and you might not be able to see that in the validation. Absolutely. I definitely agree that that's a valid concern. But yeah, I guess it's, it's hard to know what's. So do we know if all of the session IDs are represented in the test set as well? That information was not given to us. Okay. Um, we'll do some diving into the test data set a little bit later on, but as given to us, we are not familiar with if they came from the same sessions and are therefore the same surfaces or if they're completely brand new surfaces. And uh, just one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, are there no transitions between different surfaces within uh, a time series? Uh, sure. So um, if I can understand the question correctly, is it that, let's say, all the session ID zeros are like straight back to back versus six separate rides from the robot? I, I guess what it is, is could there be like a session 60, which is concrete, but going on to carpet? No. Nah, okay. No. So it's one singular surface, the same surface, one classification all the way through. All right, so let's go back to that class imbalance issue that I was talking about a moment before. So when I started building my neural networks, uh, I was getting a lot of confusion matrices that looked an awful lot like this. And I've highlighted the problem. Uh, the hard tiles, I am missing every single solitary one. This is a worst case scenario. I have a, a severely underrepresented class, and it's very easily confused with another class that I'm trying to work with. Problem. Um, so we need to address this. When we have this sort of problem, there's a couple of different options that we have for dealing with class imbalance in neural networks. Uh, the first option is the best, and it's my favorite, and it's the one where you do nothing. Uh, neural networks are awesome, I think we would all agree on that, and you'd be amazed how often your network can simply learn from the limited number of training samples that it's given to you. Considering that it's both the easiest option and the default option, it's probably the one you should go with first. Uh, unfortunately, as we just saw, in this case, that's not going to cut it, so we're going to have to move on and try something a little bit more robust. Uh, another option for us is to undersample or oversample. In the event of undersampling, I would simply draw from the majority classes a limited number to bring their number of samples more in line with the minority classes. Uh, I don't want to do this. I only have 3,800 samples to deal with. That is a tiny, tiny number for a neural network. I don't want to throw away good data. Uh, another option is to wait. In this case, you can set this up when you're training your model in Keras. It's super simple, and it simply multiplies by a constant for the minority classes. This means when you're trying to minimize your loss function value, uh, it's going to pay more attention to the misses in the minority class than in the majority class. 
This is very effective. I used this for a couple of models, and it ended up working out pretty well. But clearly, the reason I'm here is to talk about the last option, uh, SMOTE, Synthetic Minority Oversampling Technique. Let's talk about SMOTE. Anyone here who's done image classification before is familiar with this technique. We know that neural networks run on data. We want to give it as much data as possible to create as robust a network as possible. So I'm going to take my image, and I'm going to modify it slightly. Maybe flip it across the axes, shear it, spin it, uh, shift it over, zoom in, and pan, and feed in each one of these as its own separate sample. This is an awesome technique for image classification, and it's been proven time and again. Uh, this is so standard that you can implement it in Keras with like a line or two of code. It's barely even worth mentioning anymore in image classification. It really is that awesome. Uh, Smote is attempting to do this, but not for image classification, just classification. Um, I, I see the looks on your faces. I know what you are all thinking. Uh, let's look at how it works first, and then we will address the gigantic elephant in the room. Uh, here's how Smote works. Uh, we have a very simple example. On the left is a three-class classification problem, purple, green, and yellow, uh, with two features on the x and the y-axis. Smote functions in two steps. Step number one, identify the key most representative samples of the minority classes. And step two, draw a line between those samples and plot a number of synthetic points across those lines, bringing the number of the minority class up to equal of the majority class. And you can see an example of that happening over there on the right. Uh, before I go on any further, Smote has a dozen different variations to suit your need. Regression versus classification, categorical variables versus numeric. Uh, a super popular variation is called Adassign, which works like Smote, but then jiggles all of the synthetic points a little bit, so they're not just linear combinations of the other points. Uh, so really cool options available. Uh, let's address the elephant in the room. This works for one really good reason. If I take a picture of a cat and I shift it 10 pixels to the left, it's still a picture of a cat. Guaranteed, which means I'm adding new data, and I'm adding correctly labeled new data. Doesn't it seem like there's a possibility that when I start plotting brand new points, I'm going to start mislabeling those points? And all of a sudden, in a worst case scenario, I have just added thousands and thousands of fake samples to my data set that are all mislabeled. And that sounds like a recipe for a network that is just never going to learn anything. So what is SMOTE? Is it this awesome, amazing image classification as a technique that you should always implement, or this complete nonsense garbage? Why am I even mentioning it? Uh, the truth, as is most things, lies somewhere in the middle. Uh, SMOTE will not always work. You're going to have to test it out yourself and see if you get any sort of benefit in your network. Uh, it also is not going to give you a huge improvement. We're talking a little bit on whatever metric you're using. But in a competition setting, that might be what you need. Um, the big issue. Is it a problem if Smote mislabels samples? Uh, and the answer is not necessarily. And I know that's a pretty heavy lift, but here's the basic idea. Let's imagine we were just using the original data set on the left, and I gave you some features that put it square right where the yellow blob is. Odds are your model's going to pick yellow most of the time. In fact, we can't even see the purple or the green sample sitting in that gigantic yellow blob. Smote, on the other hand, purposefully goes in and puts several points in that blob now, making it much more likely that the new network will occasionally predict purple and green in that area. So while we're going to start missing more on yellows, we may now start getting more on greens and purples, where before we may have never selected green and purple for our prediction, now we may occasionally get it. And the goal is to get enough of those correct to make up for the new misses being introduced. This sounds an awful lot like the problem that we're trying to deal with right now, which is why I happen to go with it. Um, one last note to make about Smote before I move on. Um, it adds a lot of new data to your data set. I ended up from 3,800 samples to over 7,000. I was nearly doubling the training time of all of my models. So that's another thing to consider, depending on what the bottleneck in your personal setup is. Um, so here is an example of the confusion matrix that I was getting afterwards. I am now very happy that I'm hitting most of the hard tiles, so my network is, in fact, being able to identify them. It is coming at the expense of a lot of false positives. However, across the many models that I tested, I was improving my accuracy 2 to 3% across the board. So in this particular case, Smote seemed to work out pretty well. So takeaway number one, Smote is helpful for skewed classification problems. Any questions or thoughts or, or got to get them out about Smote before we move on? Yeah. Uh, 
Sorry, I missed the part. Is this mode uh, like a native library you can use from Keras or something? Uh, it's a Python library that you can uh, import. I don't remember the name of the library off the top of my head. You have it? Yeah. Imbalance Learn. Imbalance Learn. Imbalance Learn. Yeah, IMB Learn. IMB Learn, Imbalance. Yeah, a really great option when you're finding that you are missing just every single prediction on a class. Like you, you starting to believe that your model's not learning how to identify that in any form where you think you might miss every single prediction on that class in, in your test set. All right, so enough about the data. We have uh, smoted it, I guess, um, and we're going to go and talk about how to build, how to build our model. Uh, so whenever I'm building a neural network, I always like to start by taking a dive into the data and thinking, uh, what is it that I hope, to, uh, I hope to extract from the data? What am I going to be learning, and how is that data going to be formed? And that's going to inform the kind of architecture that I'm going to build. So this was my big takeaway. See, see if you agree with me on this. Uh, I have a tile floor that I want to I classify. We saw before that there's these really great bump features that we can find in the data whenever the robot's crossing between two tiles. So knowing that there's a bump would be a great way of identifying it as a tile floor. But there's a bit of a problem. If I put the robot down on the circle versus the rectangle, the bump is going to appear, but in a different place in the time series. In addition, different tile floors have different size tiles, so the bumps can appear more or less frequently in different places. They're not even necessarily just time shifted. They can appear many times or a few times if we have very big tiles. So what in essence I need to do is find a sequence of data that can appear anywhere across the entire data set. Here's the idea that we're kind of going for. Uh, here's the linear acceleration. Let's pretend that the handful of consecutive elements that I've pulled out on the left represent a bump. When I see that feature, I'm pretty confident that I'm dealing with a tile floor. I need to search through all the elements in the data set to find where it may be appearing, no matter where it may be. So maybe here I would say not present. Here it would be maybe present, maybe it's a bump. Here it would be, yeah, totally a bump, uh, definitely. Uh, here maybe not so much. That's what I want. I need to find it wherever it is, and I need to classify how strong the match is. May I introduce the one-dimensional convolutional layer? For those of you who have done image classification problems, you are obviously familiar with 2D convolutional layers. Same thing, down a dimension. Uh, who would have thought that this problem had so much in common with image classification? But apparently it does. Uh, this ended up being the backbone of my entire work, so I'm going to take a bit of a dive into how the convolutional layer works and hope that I can impart some really cool uses for it. Uh, here's how the one-dimensional convolutional layer works. I have my input, the time axes, 128 elements, and my features, nine different features that we're working with. First hyperparameter I need to set is the window size. How many consecutive elements am I looking for in the sequence that identifies the surface? For the example, I've chosen five. You're going to have to do some testing to find the ideal value. I extract the first five elements. I do my standard multiplying and adding of weights and biases and my activation function, and I get an output. The way that you can think of the weights and bias and the activation function might be as a filter. It's looking for a specific pattern, and the output quantifies how well it matches what the filter is looking for. So in our example, if our weight and bias and activation function are looking for this bump, uh, then it's going to give us an idea of how strong that bump matches amongst these five elements. I'm going to uh, use colors to represent it so we're not dealing with a bunch of numbers. Light colors, no match, dark colors, uh, pretty strong match. Once we've done this, we're going to slide over one spot and grab the next five elements, apply our filter, get the output, and it looks like we found a bump. Slide everything over, apply our filter, we found a really strong bump, slide everything over, and so on, all the way through the data. What we're going to get as an output, then, is a series of numbers that represent how well we're matching this feature that represents a tile floor. Um, just a couple of notes about this, too. Um, this example is a super simple example. Um, I'm literally using one filter in one pattern. That would never happen in a real network. You would obviously be looking for many, many more uh, than just this one. Um, another thing to point out is even though I'm showing it sliding from left to right, there's really no reason why I have to wait uh, for this to finish before doing this one. In other words, I can actually do all these calculations simultaneously. These are highly parallelizable. And as a result, uh, one-dimensional convolutional layers can train up to 10 times faster than a recurrent neural network. Uh, so if the big bottleneck in your training at home is your GPU, like it is for me, this is a really great option if you're trying to train as many models as quickly as possible. 
Uh, if you're still having a bit of a trouble understanding how the convolutional layer is working, I've got one last little example. It's a bit silly, but you know, sometimes the best examples really are. Uh, there is a game show in Japan that has just made its way to North America called Hole in the Wall. Uh, they reveal a wall with a cutout in it, and the person needs to match it to get through or else they get dunked. In our analogy here, the wall with the hole in it represents the weights and biases, the filter. It is looking for a specific pattern in the data. The data in this case is the person. The person matches what the filter is looking for. It's allowed to pass through and we get a strong output. And if it doesn't match, you get dunked. <laughs> so that's the broad basic idea of it. Um, yes? Uh, so using that example, um, in your one-dimensional neural network, the, the, the frame uh, that in your example was five yes. is the same as, this, as one person going through a number of different holes in the wall. Exactly. Right. Okay, so cool. the data in this case is the person, is the five pieces of data. It's basically us asking the question, uh, is this a bump that we would see in a tile floor? Give me, uh, quantify how much we're matching that. And it's the same person all the way through. Uh, yes, we're looking for the training process learns what type of filters we should be looking for. Okay, I, right? I start... think I get it, at least, the, at least the gist of it. So, good enough. <laughs> I like it. So let's fast forward a little bit. We've gone through all the data and we have our output. Um, to note, we started with 128 inputs and we have 124 on the out part. You can kind of see why this is. I've shown you the last five elements that I've grabbed, and you'll notice the very last time series step only gets used once, while the other ones get used multiple times. So we actually lose a few elements at the beginning and at the end. Again, if you've done two-dimensional convolutional layers on images, you're aware we lose the outer pixels around the perimeter. Same basic idea here, so we're down to 124. The next most common step after you get your output is to do some form of downsampling or pooling. Uh, the fact of the matter is we don't really need all 124 outputs, and getting rid of a good number of them is usually a really great next step. It increases the training speed of your network, it helps with overfitting, uh, and most importantly, we just don't need all the data. If you think about it, it kind of makes sense. If I grab five consecutive elements looking for a pattern and I don't find it, is it really likely that I'm gonna find the pattern by shifting over one step? four-fifths of the data is identical. It's very unlikely that I'm gonna go from no match at all to a very, very strong match. You'll often find instead that you'll get several no matches in a row, a couple more matches in a row, and so on. So a great way to deal with this is to max pool the data. There's another hyperparameter. I've chosen four arbitrarily, and what that means is I'm gonna grab the first four elements, and I'm gonna look at all their values and only pass out the max, the largest one basically saying amongst the first four that I've grabbed, what's the best representation of this feature or this bump that I'm looking for? Then the next four and the next four all the way down, 124 divided by four, 31 outputs, so I've downsized by a factor of four. Now, the four is an arbitrary hyperparameter. I could set it to 124. Global max pooling. Look across all the data, give me the single best representation. Uh, this is really great if all you care about is whether or not a feature is present in the data. Is there a bump? Give me the best example of it in the data set that I'm looking at. Uh, now, there is a bit of a downside to this as well, of course. Uh, if I had a different data set that has one bump and another data set that has 20, all of them would get pooled down exactly the same. Uh, so if the number of times the bump appears is important, this isn't going to work. Maybe one bump is an accident and 20 bumps is like, wrap it up, go home. This is definitely the correct answer. Uh, so in that case, you're going to want to do an average pool. As the name implies, you average together all the values. The more strong values you get, the stronger the overall output. And as you may have guessed, you can do a global average pool, average everything together, a single number, generalizing how often we're finding this particular feature that we're using. So that's the basic overview of a one-dimensional convolutional layer. They're super awesome because now that we have this nice little setup here, uh, convolutional layer, normalize the output, and then pool, we can start to do the next thing that we do when we're doing image classification. We start stacking layers. So now we can pass that output into a second layer on the convolutional network. Uh, what this is going to do is allow our network to make even stronger, deeper connections about the types of patterns that you might find in the data set. Really awesome, really strong way to have a great output for your accuracy. I want to note the hyperparameters on each of these layers are not necessarily the same. In fact, they're often different. So we need to train window size, how many consecutive elements, stride, how far over we move every step, uh, what type of pooling, and we need to do it for each layer. 
Um, so a lot of the time you save in training, you give up in looking through all of these hyperparameters. Uh, there is another issue that we need to address with this setup as well. Let's pretend that a uh, sequence of five is just the best. I've done my testing. Uh, a sequence of length five does a really good job of finding patterns. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I can't still find great patterns of length 17 or length 30, right? There may be multiple different sequence lengths that have identifying information, and I'm not seeing those. So another great option is to do something that looks like this. Copy your data several times and pass all the data into multiple inputs in your network, each one using different hyperparameters. In my final network, I had one of length 5, 11, 17, and 31. So I'm now identifying sequence patterns of four different lengths. But this is still not as good as we can go. What if there's some information that can be gleaned from looking at all the data at once, all 128? Because I'm not doing that right now. My biggest window is 31 consecutive elements. There's 128. I'm still missing out on something. Uh, you could conceivably ha have an input where the window is 128. Uh, there were some people who did do that. Uh, but I prefer this setup instead. Let's take this and, and put it over to the side. And I'm going to add in another input that I'm calling my meta features. Uh, the meta features are any numbers that I can calculate that put all of the data from a single sample together. Maybe the standard deviation of some of the features to kind of categorize how much movement there is in the linear acceleration or angular velocity. Uh, the max and the min values would be really helpful as well. What's the biggest spike in angular velocity we see and what's the smallest that we see and so on. Pass those through a few dense layers, concatenate the whole thing, a few more dense layers, soft max output, and we have a network that is getting somewhere between 65 to 68% accuracy uh, based on the, the variation of the hyperparameters. So this was the setup of my model that I used. Uh, one small note about it, though. I actually only ended up using six of the nine features, the three linear accelerations and the three angular velocities. No orientation data, as someone may have alluded to just a little bit earlier. I actually dropped the orientation data entirely. We'll see why in just a moment. Another person submitted a model that was very similar to mine that did just slightly better, 71% accuracy. Here's what they did, and I thought this was super clever. Same basic setup, but they had six convolutional uh, inputs, but instead of copying the whole data set six times, they separated each one of the six features and put that into each one of the inputs. Benefit of this, your convolutional layer can really hone in on that one feature really well. Downside, uh, if there's any sort of interplay between the features that it needs to identify, that's a little bit harder to, to find. Overall, better than mine, though, uh, 71%. Uh, question? Question. Uh, did this happen to um, Did you happen to uh, visualize the filters to see if you can uh, find any, any physical intuition by looking at the filters, whether they're picking up depending on which layer they are in? Sure. So um, actually looking at the filters is, is a lot more complicated than I may have led on with the example. It's nice to learn to kind of think about a filter looking for a specific, let's say, bump. But in actuality, what the, feature, uh, what the filters are actually picking up on and what they're looking for can be wildly abstract and actually really hard to specify. It's actually pretty unlikely that you'll ever get a filter that you can look at and immediately say, oh, it's looking for a bump, or oh, it's looking for a shag carpet, or, or anything along those lines. Um, if you look at the same idea for image classification in two-dimensional convolutional layers, you'll often find vaguely interpretable images, um, lines and edges, and, and small features that it might be looking for. All right, cool. Uh, so takeaway number two, one-dimensional convolutional layers are great for modeling sequence data, and not just time series sequence data. Anytime you're looking for several things in a row and you don't care where they are in the larger picture, one-dimensional convolutional layers are great. Words in a sentence and you don't care where it appears in the sentence, awesome. Uh, sounds in a larger sound, images in a video, anything where you're looking for some sequence of data, but you don't care where in the sequence you might find it. All right, let's transition, let's talk about the kernels, and let's take a look at the winning solution. Uh, so for those of you who have never done a Kaggle competition before, there's a tab on each page that you can click on that show you the kernels. They are essentially public Jupyter notebooks where people who are competing in the competition post their work and their solutions for you to use. They're an awesome resource if you're stuck or you're stumped or you want some ideas moving forward. Uh, you'll often also find people who label kernels as starter code. 
awesome for first timers. It shows you how to load the data, clean it, organize it. Some of the better ones even give you some guiding questions to kind of get you started. Um, if you just go to the kernels right away, though, I think you're kind of robbing yourself of the opportunity to make the discoveries. Uh, there's a little bit of data leakage in there, right? Once you see the models that people are creating, you can't unsee that. So I try to wait until I'm a bit stuck before I go to them. Uh, you, on a, on a more traditional Kaggle competition with a cash prize, you will find people posting solutions that will get you to the top 20% sometimes. You can fork their kernel, rerun their code, and you can, I guess you can place in the top 20% if you really count that as any sort of victory. Um, obviously, if you were sitting on a cash prize, you're not going to post your solution until the competition is over. Uh, I'm not going to give away my $50,000 solution. You might be able to see where I'm going with this. See, there was no cash prize for this competition. And on top of that, uh, if you were a more senior data scientist or senior Kaggler, this problem was probably pretty easy for you. So 48 hours after the competition began, a more senior Kaggler posted a solution with 73% accuracy, which was good enough for third place. End-to-end -end solution. You could fork this kernel, rerun all the code, and two minutes later, yes, you could be in third place. Uh, this was the most forked kernel in the competition. At one point in time, there was a 116-way tie for 73% accuracy. Not a call out on anyone, you know, not saying everyone did it. Maybe a few people got inspiration. Uh, let's take a look at what that solution was. Uh, so the one that's probably jumping out at all of you right now, Random Forest. Everything I did was with neural networks. I made that decision early on, even though I knew with 3,800 samples, it was an uphill battle. Uh, neural networks run on data. I had very little to work with. And in this case, it turned out Random Forest ended up being the way to go. Uh, they also K-fold ensembled uh, their model. And what that means, right, if you've ever done classic machine learning, of course, you're going to do K-fold cross-validation. You can actually save each one of those cross-folded models and then predict on all of them at the end. So if you do 10-fold cross-validation, you'll get 10 models, all of them slightly different because they were all trained on 9 tenths of the data, a different 9 tenths, uh, and you can combine their results by summing them or averaging them, and that'll give you a slightly more robust solution. Uh, in fact, this ended up working so well that some people got the great idea of, hey, 10-folds, I've got an idea, 20-folds. Fork the kernel, change the 10 to a 20, rerun it, and congratulations, you are now in second place with 74% accuracy. But that's OK, because someone else had a better plan, changed the 20 to a 30, and now you're sitting at 75%. This genuinely went on until we got to 50-fold cross-validation. We had people running 50 model ensembles for this nonsense, pretty clearly overfitting on the public test data set by this point, I have to imagine. But that's nothing compared to the feature engineering. Um, random forests have no concept of time series or sequence data in the way that a neural network does. So all of the features need to be engineered to go into it. Uh, these are going to be similar to the meta features that I discussed in my models a little bit earlier. So they put together a number of uh, meta features and pass them into the random forest. And the thought was, well, if some features are good, you know what's better? More features. Take the numbers, smash them together, I don't care how, and get more features. If your score goes up, congratulations, post it, people fork it, and then add even more features. The features don't improve your score, toss them, try some new ones. At the end of the competition, we had people submitting models with 1,100 different features from the nine original that we started with. Here are some of them. Okay, I can kind of sort of get behind the idea of the first two. Trying to generalize the amount of linear acceleration in totality in the data set. Okay. I'm not exactly sure how the ratio of the total angle in degrees uh, to the total linear acceleration is supposed to give you anything meaningful for discerning what kind of surface you're driving on. But this is just the start, because this is all of the data that used all nine features. What about all the ones that only used a single feature? Mean, max, min, interquartile range, standard deviation, range, median, and so on, and so on, and so on. My absolute favorite, Average of the min absolute values and the max absolute values. Of course, the secret sauce that was going to give us the solution to this problem. This went on for weeks until finally somebody had enough. And two weeks before the end of the competition, someone wrote on the discussion boards the call-out post to end all call-out posts, titled The Orientation Sensor, or Science Versus Alchemy. Uh, this person essentially wrote two weeks before the end of the competition that every single one of the 1,200 competitors was doing the competition wrong. That's a pretty bold statement to come in right before the end of the competition and say, you all are doing it wrong, only I know how to do it correct. 
you may notice underneath his name on the left side, this person won first place in the competition. Uh, so you call everyone out, you tell them only you know how to do it, and you back it up with a first place victory, that is a mic drop. Um, <laughs> If you competed in this competition, you owe it to yourself to read this in its entirety. My summary cannot do it justice. But in essence, what he said was through his testing, he came to the conclusion that the orientation data is completely useless. Let's think about it. If the orientation of the robot is changing, then clearly there's a force acting upon it. And what's all the other data we have? All the forces acting on the robot. The orientation data is redundant. And so he dropped it from his model. Furthermore, he challenged everyone in the competition who was using the orientation data to justify their decision. Post and respond. Why are you using this? What do you hope to learn from this feature? Because in his own words, if you can't explain what your model is learning, if you cannot explain why it's learning something, and you can't explain what you're doing, then you're not doing data science, you are doing alchemy. You are mashing together numbers until you end up with something slightly better than random. I'd like to say that I independently came up with the amazing idea to drop the orientation data from my model, but I did not. I read this post, I was thoroughly convinced, and that's why I dropped my orientation data. Same with the other person whose model I showed you. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Because by this point in time, people were scoring in the low 90% in accuracy. But this person discovered when they dropped the orientation data, their model was capping out at about 71%. There's a bit of a problem here. If the data is useless, then dropping it shouldn't have an effect on your model. How are we losing 20% in accuracy by dropping useless data? Here's the claim. It's a little bit complicated, but I'm, I'm going to try my best. Stick with me. Uh, remember those session IDs from way back at the beginning, the 71 separate times they took the robot out? Well, the claim was that those weren't just taken from the same surface, but from the exact same drive. That is, they put the robot down in a corner, rode it across the room to the other side, took the robot back and uploaded the data. They took the first 128 elements and made that sample one. They took the next 128 and made that sample two. And they took the next 128 and made that sample three. Combine that with the fact that, as we saw earlier, the orientation data remains remarkably consistent across. And we have a recipe for a massive amount of data leakage. Because if you find two samples with very identical orientations, you have likely also found the same surface. So it turns out that the models using the orientation data weren't really learning anything so much as they were identifying, hey, same orientation, same surface. This would clearly never generalize to a new test data set. Where's the evidence? Here's what we're trying to prove. I have sample number zero, the last time step 127, and there's my orientation data. I'm going to write an algorithm that goes through and looks for other samples, time step zero, with the most similar orientation data, just measured by the, uh, the size of the difference between each one of them. Using this process, a number of plots were created that looked like this. This is complicated. I'm going to try to walk you through it. What we're interested in, you'll notice there are 10 rows for each of the 10 original features. Uh, the ones we're interested in are the top four, the orientation X, Y, Z, and W. This is the type of plot that was created using the algorithm that I just identified. Last time stepped orientation data, first time step orientation data from a different sample, put it back together. After that was created, we then viewed what the other six features looked like. And to me, this was the smoking gun. This is proof positive. Look how nice those other six features flow together. You cannot tell where one sample ends and the next one begins. If people were upset before about a senior Kagler coming in and posting the solution to the competition 48 hours after it started, people were livid about the fact that the entire answer set could be leaked in such a way. And so the question became, can we extend this to the test data set? Yes. Here's the public leaderboard at the end of the competition. There's our poster, third place, 100% accuracy, uh, no machine learning whatsoever. And you'll also notice another handful of people who wanted to independently verify their results, and so they ran the tests as well. Um, in the final days of the competition, as everyone waited for the final private leaderboard scores to be revealed, a number of different camps broke out. Uh, one camp thought that this was all uh, a trick on the part of Kaggle, and that the private test data set was separately collected, trying to fool anyone who used the orientation data. And their scores would just plummet when they saw the brand new data, where they couldn't lean on the leaked orientation data. Um, still others thought that it was like a meta competition on the part of Kaggle, um, that they purposefully put the leakage in there. So if you could find it and exploit it, you could get a really good score. So maybe not necessarily building a strong model, but trying to find the problem and exploit it. And still others fell into a third camp, my camp, which is 
they made an honest mistake. Like they were trying to do a fun competition to bring awareness to this really amazing career con. Maybe they asked some people to collect data who don't have experience with like what you need to do specifically to make sure that something like this doesn't happen. There was no cash prize, so they just kind of just kind of went for it and they ended up messing up. Um, either way, we all waited. Uh, I tried to build suspense, but you already know the answer because you saw it a few slides ago. Congratulations to our winner, 100% accuracy. Winner of the competition, uh, no machine learning uh, of any kind whatsoever. <laughs> it turns out after the competition ended that there was a concerted effort to try to find the best model that didn't use the orientation data. Uh, the best we were able to find was about 73% accuracy. So as much as we know, that's more or less the cap of what you could expect without uh, using the orientation data. Uh, a whole ton of models were used and scored in the top 100 uh, that were just models built on this orientation data. Uh, Kaggle never responded, they gave out the prizes, and that was more or less the story. So, takeaway number three, data leakage. Always consider how your model is learning. Uh, if your uh, data science courses were anything like mine, you had exactly one lesson on data leakage. Your professor introduced the concept, they told you what it was, they maybe showed you an example, they wagged your finger and said never do this, and, and that was the end of it. And then when you're building a model, you're like, oh, data leakage. Uh, I'm going to separate my training, my validation, and my testing data, and then it just kind of goes into the back of your mind, and you don't worry about it anymore. Uh, this is possibly the greatest lesson that I got prior to going out and looking for work, and it didn't even come from my classes. I came from this competition. Data leakage is not something that should be sitting in the back of your mind at, at all points in time. It's something that should be in the forefront of your mind at all times. It can take many different forms, and it can be really devious to find. And the last thing you want to have happen is to take your model that you've worked on for weeks or months and discover that it's completely useless. So number three, data leakage. Always consider how your model is learning. Um, so that's the competition. In closing, just my final thought. Um, in the weeks that I spent working on this competition and then the subsequent weeks I spent on uh, the presentation, I kept coming back to this phrase over and over again, uh, science versus alchemy. Uh, it really kind of stuck with me because... This is a silly competition about robots driving around on carpet floors. It, it doesn't really matter at the end other than what you took away from the experience. But I think everyone in here hopes that at some point in time they're making the types of models that actually do impact the real world. And as a result, all of us owe it to ourselves and to the people who are using our models to make sure that we are doing data science and not alchemy. That we take the time to learn how our models are working, what they're taking away, and how they're making their decisions. Making sure that we don't end up deploying a black box that we do not understand and that we can't control. I'm a comic book geek at heart. I gotta say it, with great power comes great responsibility. I apologies. Um, with that being said, um, way back on the first day of the career con, there was a panel for newly hired data scientists who just transitioned into the field. Uh, and the question came up, uh, about the future of data science. In a world where auto ML that will automatically do machine learning for you exists, in a world where the tools to create machine learning models are at everyone's fingertips, in, in a world where business majors take introduction to neural networks their freshman year of college, what is the job, what is the future of a data scientist? Uh, and one of the panelists had this to say, uh, because of this trend of auto ML and packages that are really well built making it very easy for anyone to indiscriminately apply machine learning, I think that the next step is thinking through, are we applying this correctly, without biases, and with ethical constraints? We need to think about this as we apply machine learning to fields with real human consequences. Uh, so thank you all very much for listening to my presentation. Uh, there's all my contact info again. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. So this is just a comment. Uh, I wanted to point out for everybody's benefit that there's a really cool library for, for doing classification problems with time series data. Oh, yes. And it'll do all the, all the feature engineering for you. So it's, it's this auto ML sort of thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it, so it handles like Fourier type features and wavelet type features and, and all sorts of things. So, and it also does feature selection for you. So oh, very cool. a very automated way of, of doing feature. Yeah, it's called TS Fresh. TS Fresh. Very cool. Huh? I have a question for, uh, for Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> 
Is the is this conference that he's talking about? Is that the same one that Kiri presented at? This was a virtual job fair. It was streamed entirely on YouTube. I don't oh. think there was any any physical location that people went to. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, did you try any uh, LSTMs, by directional LSTMs or anything yeah, like that? Yeah, in fact, uh, I originally had a whole thing on recurrent neural networks that I, I ended up cutting due to, due to time. I spent a good deal of time trying recurrent neural networks um, to middling results. Um, in addition to the fact that they're incredibly slow to train compared to the one, to, as you, I guess you, you noted. Okay, so that's the first reason I switched, was you could train literally 10 models in the time to do one recurrent. Um, but more than that, too, I noticed that it was having trouble, like with the tile floor example, um, when there's a variation of the distance in between the important features, it was kind of having trouble identifying those particular samples. Um, so I did for a while and then, and then dropped it to move on to convolutional layers. That was very smart. The convolutional 1D was very good. <laughs> uh, you know, and it, it's amazing how you can, like, drive your head into a wall trying one method just over and over and over again. And then sometimes the best thing you can do is kind of take a step back and say, you know what, I'm just going to put that entire idea behind and just mess around with something else. And you never know what you'll stumble upon. And I just kind of accidentally stumbled on some promising results. And it just kind of led to a few more tests and a few more tests. Can you hear me? Great. Yep. Uh, I'm curious about your workflow. Sounds like you trained a lot of models. How did you keep track of everything? Sure. So this was my first Kaggle competition that I did live with the competition. And I learned a great deal about how to stay organized, mostly by practicing how not to stay organized. Um, I had this great idea, and it was amazing, and I was going to label all of the results when I uploaded them by results one, results two, results three, perfect, until um, I had somewhere between 30 and 40 uh, that I'd uploaded, and all of a sudden going back three weeks to model 16, and I had completely lost the thread on what I had done in that particular case. Um, this ended up actually being a really great learning experience if I took away just that alone. Um, you really do need to keep track and stay organized because sometimes you may end up going back 15 models into the past to pull out a really good idea and you want to have that all at your fingertips. There's nothing more frustrating than staring at a, a Jupyter notebook of files that are all labeled as like new best try and next attempt and this one will work and results 20 and it's just, it just ended up being a bit of a mess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the magic of folders. All you have to do, is, right? Am I, I'm, I can't be the only one where something will hit me, inspiration will strike, and I'm going to say, all right, good coding is going to go out the window for like 10 minutes. I got to get this idea down. And I just keep getting more excited and I keep going and going and going. When really, if I had just taken the, the few minutes at the beginning to create a couple folders, give good names to my files, and organize everything before I started, it would be so much easier in the long run. Um, so thankfully, I, uh, in my most recent project that I worked on, made, forced myself to slow down. The idea is still going to be there in a minute after I've set everything up to, to kind of keep myself organized. Oh, and since we have the time, one more really good tip. If you've never competed in a Kaggle competition before, you can upload as many models as you want. There's a, a daily cap, but you can end up uploading 100 or so. Um, but there's actually a final step that you need to do. Uh, at the, before the end of the competition, you need to pick your two most favorite models, and only those are scored. I did not know this. Um, I, I actually ended up in 1,100th place out of 1,200, um, because if you don't select, it just picks the two models that performed best on the public uh, testing data set. Uh, and I was having some fun, and I uploaded some really garbage models just to kind of mess around with the public data set to see what I could come up with and was overfitting like crazy. So I ended up with models that were no better than random chance when they scored on the private data set. So be forewarned, you actually need to select the models that you want to use at the end of the competition. Learn from my, learn from my mistake. <coughs> awesome. that, was, that was really great, Brian. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.